Thank you, Representative Merrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, and I want to say thank you to the Department of the uh, Committee of Health and Human Services uh, for allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, for the record, I am Representative of Merrick. I represent uh, COAS District 2, which includes Stratford, Stark, North Oakland, Groton, Lancaster, Randolph, Jefferson, Tweet Mountain, Carroll, Dalton, and Whitfield. Um, this will be a little awkward in the staff that I can uh, maintain the uh, ability to do this. Anyway, HB442 has come to this committee because it is about health care. I hope to shed some light on the use of cannabis as a therapeutic treatment for patients suffering from a myriad of diseases and life-threatening conditions, and to convince you that cannabis, which we know is often referred to as marijuana, should be made available as a legal medicinal option for these patients in the state of New Hampshire. Now, for those of you who are new, this is not the first time this issue has come before this committee or the legislature. As recent as October of 2009, Two Senate votes shy of overriding Governor Lynch's veto um, to accomplish this very effort. HB 442 addresses the concerns in the media the message and is the product of hours, days, months, um, and years of study and of work, including a committee of Congress, which uh, created, created once again. A, uh, a bill that is the tightest, most carefully crafted bill in the country and is designed to provide much needed relief to some of our sickest citizens, those who are seriously and terminally ill. These individuals desperately need an alternative to traditional. 
Cannabis has shown and has shown to achieve better treatment with fewer side effects for many patients than is presently available, uh, than is presently available in legal pharmaceuticals. Not only is cannabis effective for treating certain conditions, it is remarkably safe. A, 2000, a 2010 review by researchers in Germany reports that since 2005, there have been 37 controlled studies assessing the safety and efficacy of medical marijuana and its naturally occurring compounds in a total of 2,562 patients. Now, by contrast, most FDA approved drugs go through far fewer uh, trials and trials involving that many patients. Uh, so, they do spark new subjects afterwards. As I said, cannabinoids have a remarkable safety record particularly when compared to other therapeutically active substances currently being used. Most significantly, the consumption of marijuana, regardless of quantity or potency, cannot induce a fatal overdose. According to a review prepared to the World Health Organization, quote, there are no recorded cases of overdose fatalities attributed to cannabis, and the estimated lethal dose for humans extrapolated from animal studies is so high that it cannot be achieved by the user. Investigators did not find a higher incident rate of serious adverse events associated with medical cannabis, and um, especially in, compared, uh, in comparison to non-using controls over the past four decades. As the American Public Health Association noted in its official position statement, marijuana has an extremely wide acute margin of safety for use under medical supervision and does not cause lethal reactions. That can't be said about many drugs that doctors prescribe every day, including over-the-counter medications such as acetaminophen, which we know is Tylenol, which is estimated to cause about 500 overdose deaths per year. Many frequently prescribed drugs are often abused, are highly addictive, and are often stolen out of the patient's medicine cabinet to be sold on the street. Recent data shows that there is an alarming increase in the number of people dying from the misuse of controlled pharmaceuticals. Marijuana is not addictive and does not possess the legal potential of drugs such as codeine, Percocet, hydrocodone, oxycontin, and morphine to be Doctors have that patients using medical cannabis have been able to reduce or entirely eliminate their need for those and other narcotic pain relievers. So the evolution of HB442 takes all this current research and data into consideration, along with concerns that were not addressed in the previous bill, HB648. HB442 assures there are none of the guarantees that cannabis is only permitted for treatment by physicians to treat their patients who are registered by the state or are qualified by and are seen by that physician and who suffer from those conditions or symptoms that have failed other long-term treatments from presently available events. <coughs> HB442 has defined in statute a very limited number of debilitating medical conditions that may be treated it requires patients to register with the Department of Health and Human Services and carry an ID that identifies them as a qualified patient at all times. It puts physicians on notice that they risk losing the medical license if they deviate from the letter of the law. It will not cost our citizens more money. It will not add to their property taxes or limit access to quote only wealth. On the contrary, it is budget neutral and covers costs to the state fundraising efforts and revenue collected through licensing, registration, and ID fees to patients and providers, and anonymous or otherwise contributions. In fact, it's a cost savings bill in terms of reducing health care costs. A patient who may spend $1,500 or $2,000 a month on oxycontin will perhaps only have to spend $50 or $25 a month for medical marijuana. It has saved 
safeguards in place to prevent unauthorized amounts to be distributed and will limit the allowable dose on the law. It does not put, and this is important, does not put an increased strain on our law enforcement system. In fact, it's designed in a manner that guarantees that there is no interface with the illicit trade or use of cannabis. On this reason, decreasing illegal procurement by allowing Provide them with the ability to. 
they see is best for their patients instead of what government thinks is okay for a patient. So I'll ask you to please consider that. Please step back from the stigma of what you think marijuana is and listen to the patients and listen to your hearts to know that we as legislators should not ever decide what's best for a patient. Thank you. Well, at the end of the disease, the rumen spit, the 12 to 14 
gave me some, and at first I was very, very nervous about doing it because I didn't know if it was going to make the attacks worse. Well, I was uh, over the toilet getting sick, and my wife went in and grabbed it for me, and no exaggeration, 20 seconds after I smoked it, I stopped getting sick. Um, at the worst, I would get so violently ill that I actually broke three ribs when I was getting sick. The marijuana doesn't help with the vertigo. The room continues to spin. There's nothing I think they can do to stop that. But it did help me from throwing a ball over my house. So I, I thought I would have the marijuana change because I was personally affected by it and I understand what it can do. Um, luckily, last year I had an injection in my head. I had multiple injections, which I saw a tube inside my head. Um, and it actually stopped the vertigo attacks. Unfortunately, it may not stay stopped. There is a possibility that this can come back and then end up where we go again. So uh, I support this bill probably because uh, it's more of a personal thing to me because I've actually seen what this can do. Um, I, I think it's the right time where we start helping people. Um, so I just want the time to get up and tell my story. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Representative George Lambert. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have to say that the first time I came up here to hand out flyers, it was in support of a medical marijuana bill a couple years ago, and I said, if I'm going to run for office, this could kill it. Today, I'm proudly standing before you as a representative who says, you know what? This is the right thing. If a patient who has cancer in another state goes gets a prescription for medical marijuana and brings that prescription to this state, their possession charge could cost them a year in jail. Our laws on this are particularly one-sided and draconian. We have a lot of people who would come out here and say, you know, I support this, except there's the potential contamination that when I stand up for it, I'm admitting I broke the law. That's a problem. When they asked in Massachusetts about marijuana, the polls said it probably wouldn't pass. Yet when people went in behind a curtain and nobody was looking at their vote, they said, you know, marijuana, not so bad. Our society as a whole, according to the Wall Street Journal, has said that there's less social stigma, there's less medical problems. There's no, yeah. Our society has said, this is something we're willing to consider. When the VA hospital said, if somebody has a prescription, we'll bring it into our hospital, that changed my entire perspective. And when I told somebody downstairs that I support this particular bill, they said, that probably means you smoke it. I said, let's go. Take me to the nurse's station, happy to pee in your cup right now, and prove I don't. But it doesn't mean that I don't support the opportunity for the people who are sick to have it. Because that's my job. There are our constituents who actually would like this as an option. It's time for New Hampshire to give our constituents that opportunity. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Representative. Representative Hall. Thank you. Representative Hull, Mayor Mac 13. Um, I testify on, on behalf of this bill for two reasons. One of which was I worked at a drug rehab for seven years. I understand firsthand the effects of gateway drugs. I understand firsthand what happens when people are addicted to opium and, and heroin and other things. I've seen what happens when people are addicted to alcohol. Okay? This bill was drafted um, to allow the people who need it, okay, um, because they're nearing the end of life. There's serious medical um, issues to be able to relieve pain. There's a big difference between that and the, the preconception that this is a gateway drug, that we're going to have people um, going out and getting doctor's notices for all sorts of things. The second thing I testify on is I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. 
Um, I work with a company called Segway, and we build products that emulate the balancing that we do when we walk every day. Um, okay, it's, it's very difficult. Two-year-olds figure out how to walk. It actually takes a lot of engineers to figure out how to make a machine do the same thing in terms of balancing in place. We don't know enough about how our body interacts with some of the pharmaceuticals out there to alleviate pain. We don't have, I mean, pharmaceutical companies spend lots of money on research, okay? But to do justice to figuring out how every drug interacts with every person is a substantial effort. Here we have something that's been around as a natural product for a very long time and has an established history of not creating issues, yet we're outlawing it to benefit a small set of pharmaceutical companies, and I find that disappointing. Thank you. Uh, neither in support or opposing the bill, we'll hear from John Wallace from HHS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My understanding, and I think I'll all start to make part of the research. My understanding is that you do not have the fiscal note uh, yet. We have completed our part, and uh, I understand there are other state agencies that are still submitting information that's necessary to finish that. But uh, the concern we have is that we, the department has a lot of responsibilities under this bill. If you pass this bill and it becomes law, within 180 days we have to provide rules for all the individual users, the caregivers, uh, the uh, treatment centers, and so on. And there are substantial requirements that we would then have to do in terms of uh, processing applications and issuing the registry identification cards to the individuals, uh, the photo identification cards, the caregivers uh, have to be certified. There are background checks, there are uh, criminal background checks for people at the alternative treatment centers. We have to develop a confidential registry of who are the qualified patients, designated caregivers, and we have to uh, track the number of patients. We have to uh, verify for law enforcement to have a process with that, that somebody is authorized to have this. We have to verify for a landlord or a court or uh, anyone that it is an authorized card. We have to submit a name report to the legislature and users. We have to uh, issue the cards for the laws to reissue them if the, if the caregiver changes. We have to do a change there. We have to tell the treatment centers whenever there's a change in those processes. Uh, and so, as part of this process, we need to uh, not just set up the rules for them and the processes we have to develop that, but we also have to have some kind of confidential registry that law enforcement can have access to in order to verify some of the information on that. With respect to the treatment centers, there is a substantial amount of oversight that we would have to do in terms of uh, security requirements, sanitary requirements, electrical safety requirements, uh, personnel requirements, and so on. That is. Now, we do not have people to do this. There's no money in this bill to do this. And so I'm not sure. I mean, somewhere in the process, if you're going to do this, you have to think about how we would get the money in advance to have the personnel to actually do this. There's a provision in there that says the fees uh, should be enough to support the system, uh, but unless and until we have the resource to set it up, uh, we're not going to be able to have the fees coming in to support it. It's a matter of timing. I'm not sure how that works, but that's the complication factor. So that if you're going ahead with it somewhere in the budget, we have to have allocations for the staff and the uh, information systems to make that work. Uh, we had anticipated or we projected that it would require a couple of personnel, a clerk and a program specialist of some sort to oversee it. And we would, uh, there's some administrative costs that we could, that support that we could do that, but we would need some kind of automated toll-free system to check on verification of these things after hours as necessary for law enforcement. So there's a database requirement Staff so we had anticipated uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars being necessary 
for the first year of this operation to support the personnel and, to, and the other thing, and then diminishing to uh, by about seventy thousand dollars left in the ensuing years. Uh, part of the concern is that when you're doing these in the second phase, you do not know how many people are going to sign up. And so <clears throat> trying to set a fee based upon as a reasonable fee that people could support in anticipation of that's going to be fairly difficult to do. And I'm, I'm not sure how exactly to do that. There are also some uh, technical issues about timing in the bill that, that you may want to look at, one of which requires us to issue uh, certifications within 15 days, but safety gets 30 days to do background checks and whatever, so I, I'm not sure how we how we get all of that done. But that my, my principal issue here is uh, we do not have the resources to actually do this, and so somewhere in this we've got to have the upfront ability to carry out our responsibilities uh, under, under the law. I'm not commenting any one way or the other as to whether you should do this, but that's that's uh, our concern about our ability to get our responsibilities on the section. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Karen Michael. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I have written testimony. Would you like me to provide it at this time? My name is Karen Eckel. I um, work, I'm Assistant Attorney General. I work uh, in the Criminal Bureau at the Department of Justice. And I'm here on behalf of Attorney General Delaney. Uh, the Attorney General understands the compassionate purpose that is driving this uh, legislative initiative. However, he opposes it because it is his concern that its passage would result in an array of law enforcement issues including the diversion of, of scarce and limited law enforcement resources towards the investigation of marijuana-related crimes. Marijuana is the most uh, widely used illegal drug in our state. And other states that have passed this legislation should serve as examples of how difficult it is to contain and to systematically control who will have lawful access to this drug. It is much harder than it looks. Most, if not all, states have failed to keep the recreational use of medical marijuana out of the medical marijuana um, equation. Small groups of, of patients are benefiting while large groups of other persons are abusing the law. Citizens in these states are frustrated. The laws are not working the way they expected them to look. In such states as California and Colorado, you could say that the, mar the medical marijuana experiment has failed. The laws are too loose, too strict, too vague. The feds continue to scrutinize and arrest persons who operate and um, uh, who operate uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. And repealing the laws in these states does not appear to be an option. This is the dark side of the medical marijuana experiment in our country. This bill is part of that experiment. No state has, got, has, has quite gotten it right yet. This is a new model. Only New Jersey has this particular uh, similar uh, bill, law, and they have not yet been able to implement it. I have included written testimony for the committee to review um, that compares the New Jersey uh, law to House Bill um, 442 for your review. Under the bill, as you know, qualified patients will be able to, to purchase their marijuana only through, the, um, through the, these particular alternative treatment centers. The bill is silent, however, on how the centers are initially supposed to uh, acquire their inventory. 
And despite the current hands-on approach of the, of the uh, administration, the federal administration, um, it is not known how DEA will view these alternative treatment centers, which are essentially uh, pharmacy models where patients go to get their marijuana. Some of the tech, there are some technical problems with the bill. The definition of debilitating medical condition is unclear. As written, it states that the presence of both A, a chronic medical or terminal disease, and then it states or, as opposed to and, other diagnosed medical condition. You, you already know that the federal law has not changed. The status of, of marijuana is the same. Um, and that legislation has survived uh, constitutional scrutiny. The federal government still discourages the research into um, the medical uses of smoked marijuana. We also know that medical, state medical marijuanas, while they do eliminate the most relevant legal barrier to using the drug, they also foster a more tolerant and um, personal and social attitudes towards the drug. Uh, we also know from prevention science that teens are most likely to use things that are A, available, and B, that they perceive as having a low risk factor. In New Hampshire, as well as across the nation, the perception of risk regarding uh, marijuana for teens is on the decline. And its use by teens is on the rise once again. There is very important work being done in our state right now to address the issue of youth and drug use, and I've included some of the data that's been collected by the New Hampshire Center for Excellence in the packet of information. This work encompasses prevention and early intervention treatment models. And the data that's been collected shows that the programs are working and making a positive difference. For these reasons, the Attorney General urges you to reject House Bill 442 outright. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Chief Richard Craig. Good morning. My name is Richard Craig, and I'm the Chief of Police in the town of Enfield. I'm a law enforcement officer of over 20 years, and I'm speaking here on behalf of the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association, who oppose this legislation. Marijuana is a dangerous drug. As you just heard, our youth are experimenting more with marijuana and using more marijuana now than ever. We need to send a message that marijuana is not safe. This legislation actually contradicts that. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing that increase in marijuana use, is steps like this that try to put marijuana, an illegal substance, that hasn't gone through FDA approval, stating it's medicine. We're sending the wrong message to our children, and I ask you to kill this bill and defeat this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Major Russ Conti. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to be here today and testify on behalf of the Division of State Police for the State of New Hampshire. I am a major with the State Police. I've been employed for 26 years with the State Police. This bill, which would allow the possession, distribution, and use of marijuana for medical purposes, is much better drafted than the laws in the 13 other states that allow some of the so-called medicinal marijuana. It shows an awareness of the problem these laws have created in other states. It makes a valiant effort to circumvent them. However, the Department of Safety still must oppose this bill. We believe it is bad public policy and we create more problems than it solves. First of all, despite what might happen if this bill passes, marijuana possession would still be illegal under federal law. The United States Supreme Court has ruled in the case of Ashcroft v. Rush that people who use marijuana for medical purposes can be prosecuted under, under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, even if they are using it pursuant to a doctor's prescription. 
even if such uses is legal under state law. So, you would be creating a situation where you're allowing a person to do something under state law that makes them criminal under federal law. Secondly, despite how carefully written the bill is, we fear that it will, it will constitute the first step on a very slippery slope. Based on the experience of other states, this law will create a booming business in the production and distribution of the drug and will become a highly competitive marketplace. Marijuana producers will try to see who can produce the most potent crop and advertise it as such. THC, the psychoactive ingredient marijuana, varies greatly from one producer to another. It is not like alcohol, where the blood alcohol level clearly indicates a level of impairment, or prescription drugs, where a doctor prescribing a certain number of milligrams of the drug can accurately predict what is or what is not safe for a dosage. Persons with medical marijuana prescriptions will have the substance in their houses where their teenage sons and daughters may have access to it. The prefer use or sell to their friends. We have enough problems on our highways already with drivers misusing other prescription drugs, driving under the influence of them and getting into crashes. This will provide yet another danger on the road. In the city of Los Angeles, the business took off so quickly and became so competitive that there are hundreds of medical marijuana outlets. City Council has been looking for a way to place a cap on a number of these places that will be allowed. They are becoming as familiar a site as Walgreens Pharmacy, and as some are even holding tastings to tout their product, similar to the wine tastings that vendors use to promote wine sales. Unethical physicians are giving up their regular practices and specializing in issuing prescriptions for medical marijuana. Undercover officers have gone to these places posing as customers and claiming to have some minor ailment such as a cold, which would clearly be illegal to issue a marijuana prescription for. The provider will ask, but you surely must have some pain somewhere, don't you? The buyer catches the hit and claims they have a painful groin, painful stomach, or some other pain problem, and the practitioner will quickly write them a prescription, and they are off and on their way. Officers in Colorado that we have spoken with say the same thing is happening there. You can bet if this bill passes, there will be many people suddenly describing <coughs> symptoms of severe pain, severe nausea, severe vomiting, or severe persistent muscle spasms, and peddling the drug. It will be a lucrative business to be tempting to write the prescription to look the other way. Law enforcement contacts in Montana describe their experience with a similar law as a nightmare. They have legislation pending to put more controls in place, but say it is very difficult to put the toothpaste back in the tube. They are a very similar state as New Hampshire in terms of population, economics, and ethnic backgrounds, and are quite often used as a comparative state. Montana is now number two in the nation in teenage uses of marijuana. Prior to the legalizing medical marijuana, they were 10th. One of their distributors is kind of, is ironically named the Healing Center, also known as THC. They have a website that anybody can visit. Montana currently has a stunning 28,330 card-carrying citizens that are allowed to have medical marijuana out of a population of less than 950,000. A similar percentage could be extrapolated to New Hampshire if this bill passes, and one out of every 33 citizens could be expected to possess these cards, allowing them to purchase and use marijuana. The bill does in RSA 126, colon 5, outlines a list of places and circumstances where the use of the drug might not be permitted. But even this is flawed, because it says a cardholder can be arrested or prosecuted for certain violations, but does not specifically permit a private employer or a government agency from prohibiting an employee from using the drug. It says they could be arrested, but there is no crime to arrest them for. So you will smell marijuana wafting through the airs of Elakoya State Park and other public places and in some workplaces.
This is an extremely troubling bill that runs the risk of changing the face of New Hampshire, and not for the better. So we do stand opposed. I'll take any questions, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Senator Forsyth. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. And um, sorry for jumping in front of anybody who's been here waiting for a while. Um, while uh, Senator Forsyth from District 4, Alton, Barnstead, Belmont, Guilford, Gilmington, Laconia, New Durham, and Stratford, um, while I was out campaigning, I would knock on doors, several thousand doors, and I knocked on the one gentleman's door. He's Republican, he was conservative, and he had a condition that would have been helped by medical marijuana, and he was frustrated that it was illegal. Um, so this is, this is an issue that cuts across party lines. I want to address my comments to conservatives. Um, conservatives traditionally uh, oppose Obamacare because they want the doctor, they want the government out of the doctor-patient relationship, and I think uh, medical marijuana satis helps satisfy that. We also believe in minimal regulation, and, and this helps go towards that. Um, exist existing legal medication, I'm sure many people have testified so far today, is far more dangerous than, than medical marijuana. So it's inconsistent to say this specific kind of drug is illegal while far more dangerous drugs are legal. I know many conservatives worry about this as being a stepping stone to further legalization. But you gentlemen and ladies are in the legislature. If you don't want it to be a stepping stone, you don't have to, to let it be a stepping stone or a slippery slope. Um, I urge you to pass medical marijuana for the rights of patients, and I'll answer any questions you have. Representative Case. I can. Everybody else who has testified here, I can thank you. I have a question uh, that I been want to ask, and I just was recognized a couple times. What method of administration of marijuana is the best to achieve a therapeutic level and contain that level for treating illnesses? I, I mean, I, that's not something that I can say. I think that, that's up for the doctor to say. I think it probably depends on the condition. What, what method of administration? That's all I'm like how to administer it? Yeah. Oh, as opposed to like Marinol versus... So no, how, how do you ingest it? Do you ingest it? Do you inhale it? Which is the major... Um, you don't know. No, medically, I don't know. That's something that I guess, doctor. I'm actually one of the few people my age probably who's never used Marinol. <laughs> Thank you. Representative O'Brien. Question. To answer the question of how it is ingested, uh, I have documentation here that states that it can be ingested either orally or uh, by, uh, well, it would be orally in either case, but either by pill or by uh, cigarette. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Representative Sermon. Chairman, and members of the committee, uh, oops, sorry. Um, I, I understand that there are a number of individuals that have concerns about implementing the law regarding medical marijuana. This this uh, House did pass a bill uh, last term, which I think went a long way to addressing those concerns. I think when, when faced with something new like this, you can always come up with reasons not to do it. I'm speaking more along the lines of the reasons that I think we should do it and treat the concerns that entities like Health and Human Services or the Department of Health or the Attorney General has as opportunities to, to, uh, to craft language that would allow us to implement this. I view this question as one of, of fundamental uh, rights that a doctor-patient relationship would embrace. I, I think it's difficult, especially in the current makeup of the general court, to argue that we have the, the, the right to get between the doctor and that patient. These physicians, if they determine it's in the best interest of their patient to use medical marijuana, I think it's really very difficult for us as legislators to say anything but that. Any other pain medication, any narcotic that you might want to use aside from medical marijuana is preferable. I see this as a privacy issue. I see this as a personal relationship between the patient and the doctor. I understand that there are challenges, but I think that those challenges can be met and they can be overcome. I've heard a good amount of testimony that talks about the balance between federal law and state law. Um, I can tell you that we as a general court have been doing quite a bit of work of late 
challenging the federal government in terms of when their reach into our state goes beyond what we feel comfortable with. I would argue not that we have an obligation to try to keep medical marijuana out of the doctor's office, but I would argue that the individuals, some of whom I feel are here today, who could benefit from its use have the right to access that if their physician feels that it would be in their best interest. And I think as a legislative body, uh, we should craft whatever policies are necessary to make that available to the physician and leave it at that. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Kirk McNeil. Nick Murray. Uh, I'm a student at UNH and I'm an active member of UNH Normal and 
Young Americans for Liberty on campus. Uh, I come here in front of you as a student and as a graduate of the DARE uh, Drug Education Program. The arguments against passing the medical marijuana law are usually founded on society's desire to protect young people from exposure to cannabis. In the real world, these laws have never stopped people from smoking this controversial plant, even with an astonishing 880,000 marijuana arrests now being made per year in the United States. Despite decades of prohibition, marijuana use today has been viewed by young people as being more, more normal than ever. And the majority of young people have, have accurate, accurately concluded that cannabis is a far safer drug than alcohol, let alone morphine or oxycodone. All, this, all the statistics suggest this is the case. Those are not the facts that I and my peers were presented with in the D.A.R.E. program. High school and university students today are the D.A.R.E. generation, yet we see and use drugs as much as our contemporaries 20, 30, and 40 years before us. Our current cannabis laws are, are supposed to protect youth, but they have not been effective in doing so. They have only driven the business underground. High schoolers today say that it is easier to procure marijuana than it is alcohol. That is a direct result of marijuana prohibition. Added deliberately misleading and ineffective programs aimed at frightening children, instead of telling the whole story, and we've effectively left a generation of youth without the knowledge to live in a world where drugs exist. It is a shame that various levels of government have refused to correct this blatant social discrepancy through honest drug education. Government's regulation of potentially harmful substances has never meant an endorsement of their use. Take alcohol and cigarettes, two of the most dangerous drugs in our world. We as a society recognize that these behaviors are meant for adults and not for children, yet they are fully legal for adults. Any future regulatory scheme for dispensing cannabis would surely include age restrictions and quality control provisions present in today's legal drug dispensaries like our own state liquor stores. Prohibition does not guarantee these essential precautions. In fact, it directly conflicts with consumer safety. Indeed, a legal market would be best for our patients, but guaranteeing safe access to their medicine and protection from arrest and prosecution is the baseline moral standard that this body can set for terminally ill granted status. HB 442 would establish that standard, and I urge you to support this legislation. Thank you very much. Do you have written testimony I could have, please? Nicole Rockwell. Matt Simon. Matt Simon. Call the call. She'll be, Matt, go ahead and Nicole, we'll see if we can get that microphone back to you. benefits outweigh the risk and marijuana for me can help me eat better, sleep better, help with depression and pain that I've had my whole life. I've been on pills my entire life and that's damaging my liver over time. I mean if I can use marijuana medicinally to help with my problems and it can help with me with four different problems and it's not going to be damaging my liver. I think that should be the decision of my doctor and I to choose that if the risks and the benefits outweigh each other. To me, marijuana can help me, hugely. And of course there's side effects, but isn't there side effects with every, every prescription drug that we take, but we choose with our doctor what we want. So I urge you to you know, pass this bill because it can really help people. And the most cause, the most harm is in smoking marijuana. But you can also ingest it, and it gives you the same benefits as if you smoked it. So if that is a big fight that people push, and I don't think <laughs> that, for me, marijuana helps a lot, hugely, makes a big difference. So I urge you to pass this law. Thank you. Matt Simon.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Matt Simon, and from 2007 to 2010, I served as executive director for the New Hampshire Coalition for Common Sense Marijuana Policy. In 2009, I organized dozens of patients in support of the, the law that passed the House and Senate and was vetoed by, by Governor Lynch. Today, I'm speaking only on behalf of myself as a person who studied marijuana and marijuana policy and as a person who has formed relationships with dozens of New Hampshire patients and their families who have had relevant experiences on this issue. Uh, today, I'm going to actually refer to marijuana as cannabis, as others have, because that is the scientific name. Marijuana is simply a Mexican slang term that was popularized by early pro prohibitionists to make the plant sound foreign, and particularly Mexican. But these are not the early days of prohibition. We all know that the question of whether or not cannabis should be legal has been debated for decades. But in recent years, the tide of public opinion has turned strongly in favor of legalization. A Gallup poll taken in 2010 shows that 46% of Americans now think that cannabis should be legal for all adults, meaning in practical terms that it should be regulated similarly to alcohol. This indicates the highest level of nationwide support ever recorded for full marijuana legalization. However, what we're looking at here today is not legalization, not at all. It's not even medical marijuana the way we may have seen it depicted in California and in a few other states. In many respects, this would be the tightest, most heavily restricted medical cannabis policy found in any state. And just to explain how we got to this point with the bill, here's a brief history of what happened in 2009. We had over a dozen patients come out in the snow to testify at this hearing two years ago. And the members of the committee agreed uh, that if a person is seriously ill and that person's doctor believes they should have access to medical cannabis, no law should stand between them and safe legal access. The bill passed both chambers that would allow these patients to simply grow their own plants. This is a policy that's in effect in Vermont, in, in Maine, and several other states. Uh, Governor Lynch said that he would not support that version, allowing patients to grow their own. So rather than have these patients have to suffer for a couple more years, the legislature scrambled, formed a committee of conference, and worked out the version of the bill that then again passed the House and Senate. And individual cultivation was removed. Instead, a state regulated system of nonprofit dispensaries was created, or would have been created, to serve the needs of qualifying patients. As we know, that bill fell two votes short of actually becoming law. The bill that we see today is very similar to that bill. It's been revised yet again to, to deal with the specific concerns raised in Governor Lynch's veto statement. The essence of the bill is that it would allow the creation of three to five alternative treatment centers in New Hampshire. And since 2009, I've had the opportunity to travel around the country a little bit. I've had the opportunity to tour some of the better dispensaries that are operating out in California. And essentially, there are three waves of dispensaries that have come along. As you may recall, California passed its medical marijuana law back in 1996 by ballot initiative. Uh, under that law, qualifying conditions are not restricted. It remains the only state where doctors can legally recommend medical cannabis for any medical condition whatsoever, including anxiety, insomnia, or simple back pain. So all of the examples that we've heard from law enforcement about people faking a pain in their shoulder or their neck to get access to medical cannabis, I believe this, this bill definitely doesn't allow that. Um, the first wave of dispensaries in California was mostly uh, comprised of activists who believed strongly in having medical marijuana be available, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of business sense and they weren't, they weren't medical professionals. So uh, once it became clear that these people were not being arrested in mass, other players de decided to enter that market. We saw wave two of dispensaries with uh, some former illicit dealers deciding to go legit and become dispensary owners and also other people simply looking to make a quick buck based on the new law. Again, medical professionalism was not incentivized in any way by the policy, and medical professionalism did not flourish during wave two of dispensaries. Finally, in response to patient demand, a third wave of dispensaries developed in California to most fully serve the needs of patients 
These dispensaries are run very professionally, teaching patients to use medical cannabis in more healthful ways than smoking, and testifying, uh, testing their products for potency, for the presence of mold, and for other contaminants. Last spring, during a trip to San Francisco, I was able to tour a dispensary called Harborside, and this was truly the sort of well-run facility that would be welcomed not only by patients in New Hampshire, but I believe by the general public. Uh, today, the best practices established by Harborside and other Wave 3 dispensaries are now being emulated in states such as Maine and Rhode Island. If HB 442 is passed, these are the types of well-regulated dispensaries that will be authorized to operate in New Hampshire. I uh, ask you please vote to allow this option for patients in the live free or die state. And if I could just answer Representative Key's question with regard to various ways of ingesting medical cannabis. Most of the patients that I met with in the state think there's only one way to do it, that you have to smoke it, you have to roll cigarettes and smoke it. That's actually the least helpful way for patients to ingest cannabis. That's not the method that I expect doctors will be recommending. They can either create their own uh, foods based on cannabis and, and consume them orally, which provides one effect. However, some patients suffer from extreme nausea and aren't able to take pills. Those patients, we, we believe, really need to be able to inhale marijuana. They can do that by smoking it, but they can also do that through the technology of a vaporizer. There are many products available now that will heat the cannabis to a temperature that's below the temperature of combustion. It releases the vapors, which can then be inhaled by the patient without any carbon monoxide or any of the other uh, seriously dangerous things that are in the smoke. So I believe that is what doctors in New Hampshire, once they find out about, will be recommending is vaporization for patients who need the, the, bene the fast acting benefits of inhaled marijuana. So thank you for considering my testimony and I'd be happy to any answer any questions you might have. Representative for Doug. Well, there have been many studies commissioned by the federal government attempting to prove that very hypothesis that marijuana is in fact a gateway drug. And I don't believe any of those studies have conclusively determined that smoking marijuana or using marijuana for a young person leads them down that path. It's certainly perceived by young people to be a safer substance, even safer than alcohol or cigarettes. So I don't think it's all that surprising that a lot of young people choose to try marijuana regardless of what what laws are on the books in the state. That's another thing, is we know that 15 states have medical marijuana, several states have decriminalized marijuana, and the use numbers, when you look around the country, don't seem to have any relationship to the policies. It's more affected by regional and cultural factors. Thank you. Let's, you're not recognized. Michael Cutler, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reagan, and members of the committee. My name is Michael Cutler. I'm a lawyer from uh, North Haven, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been uh, practicing law in criminal and uh, civil matters, uh, particularly uh, criminal appeals and mental health law, for more than 30 years. I'm also the proud father of a, a graduate school student. And uh, I come before you today to speak in support of uh, House 442, the uh, medical marijuana provision. Uh, I want to touch on two aspects, if I can, today. First, the federalism aspect, and uh, second of all, the, uh, the law enforcement aspect of this. With regard to uh, federalism, you heard as uh, this state is engaged in the national debate on health care that there's plenty of room for different state paths uh, apart from the federal government. Uh, in fact, uh, as a matter of constitutional law, as long as the state is not uh, actively engaged in mandating conduct that conflicts with federal law, the idea that the state condones certain conduct that might be illegal under federal law does not negate the state's right to reprioritize their use uh, of 
uh, resources. Uh, furthermore, uh, under the uh, existing uh, presidential administration, the U.S. Justice Department has issued a formal forbearance instruction to its uh, federal prosecutors around the country saying that in states that have medical marijuana laws, uh, doctors and patients uh, acting in compliance with those laws and in compliance with the distribution portion of those laws uh, will be the lowest possible priority for federal uh, intervention and resources. And we've seen in uh, the several states, the 15 states now that have allowed uh, medical use that uh, the feds have not uh, in any significant way uh, interfered with that. In fact, during the uh, Republican presidential administration, when there were a good deal of efforts made in California and to a lesser extent in Colorado to interfere with patient access, that the businesses continued uh, quite uh, uh, continued to grow the businesses of medical distribution uh, in those states. Uh, and I'd also uh, share the observation that in both of those states who have perhaps the greatest amount of experience both in terms of time, 15 years in California, and in uh, the numbers of distribution points, uh, that the state legislatures in both Colorado and California have expanded and regularized medical use since they've had more experience rather than cut back with it. Even in Montana, we heard some uh, reference made to some uh, objection to uh, their medical law. Public policy, public opinion polling still shows that those laws are very popular. So uh, I would simply suggest to you that there is uh, nothing as a matter of uh, the differences in federal policy and state policy that should be an obstacle to your consideration of these laws. Uh, finally, I, I just uh, make some further points with regard to uh, some of the observations with regard to the variability of marijuana. In uh, Colorado, uh, they have scientific scientists scientists who are using laboratories to genetically type uh, the marijuana strains that are uh, out there for distribution so that patients know what they're getting and, they, and whatever they buy in Denver can be typed and be the same type of a, a drug in Colorado Springs so that there is, uh, while variability within the plant, an ability of scientists to uh, let patients know exactly uh, what they're getting. And, uh, I would uh, simply close by saying that uh, there has been a good deal of research on uh, marijuana by the federal government use and access uh, since there have been some evolutions and reforms of the federal prohibition law. And the federal research tells us that in the states that have either depenalized uh, marijuana distribution uh, or uh, allowed medical access, that use rates have not gone up. And so I don't think that some of those concerns are uh, a reason for uh, opposing this bill. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time, and the members of the committee, if you have any questions. On thank you, Mr. Cutler. We'd appreciate your written testimony if you have it available. Bob Constantine. morning. I'm sitting down because I have severe arthritis in both hips. My name is Bob Constantine. I'm from Grafton, New Hampshire. And I've used marijuana both recreationally and medicinally. I have four main points. Uh, some of them have been covered and some of them will answer some of the questions some of the representatives have asked. The first is whether or not cannabis is safe and effective medicine. Well, it is. 5,000 year history of safe use. Don't believe me though, you should believe Judge Francis Young. When they were rescheduling or attempting to reschedule marijuana in 1988, this is what he said. He was the uh, administrative law judge, a federal judge. He said, after the study, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. By any measure of rational analysis, marijuana can be safely used within a supervised routine of medical care. I will be submitting this. The next point I'd like to make, pardon me, I thought I was gonna be sitting down at a desk, so I'm gonna be shuffling papers here. Uh, there's also a precedent that the federal uh, 
government of the United States has been providing uh, medical marijuana to one individual since 1982. It's called the uh, Investigation on the Drug Program. A gentleman by the name of Irv Rosenfeld um, has been provided at least 10 joints of marijuana each day by the federal government. I have that information here and I'll be submitting that. Also, the way uh, cannabis is scheduled both in the United States and in New Hampshire, uh, it's scheduled as, as a Schedule One drug, which means it can't have any medicinal use anywhere in the United States. Well, I think Washington, D.C., which has a medical marijuana program, is in the United States. I think the 15 states that presently have medicinal marijuana programs are in the United States. Also, a young lady earlier today referenced the uh, United States patent. I have a copy of that. It pertains to the uh, cannabinoids, which are part of uh, a marijuana or cannabis plant. Uh, I'll, I'll present that also. Uh, the gentleman on the end here, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but you did say, uh, have a question concerning smoking cannabis and so forth. Um, I have a study here that uh, was uh, conducted, I can't, I can't, it was conducted uh, and funded by the National Institute of Health uh, National, uh, on Drug Abuse and involved over 1,200 people. It was the largest study of its kind and it unexpectedly concluded that smoking marijuana even regularly and heavily, heavily does not lead to lung cancer. I have a copy of that that I'll submit. The second point that I'd like to make um, is whether or not cannabis is a gateway drug. It's not. Uh, right here in uh, New Hampshire, there was a study conducted by uh, UNH Associate Professors of Sociology. It was published in September 2010 in an issue of Journal of Health and Social Behavior. Also in 2006, the University of Pittsburgh released a more thorough study. I'll include that in my written testimony. Um, it's my belief, my personal belief, that medical cannabis shouldn't even be illegal as a power to prevent people from ingesting substances. It's never really been granted to either the federal government or the state government. All you need to do is look at natural rights under Article 2. Also, as far as the federal government goes, if you look at Article 7 of the New Hampshire Constitution, state sovereignty, they really can't tell us that we have to do that. I encourage you to read that. Cannabis is illegal because of political reasons. I think you should note that there's not a lot of people over there saying don't make this legal. The people that were over there, they either are police, prosecutors, or state bureaucrats. The last point that I'm going to make, and it's a good thing you're sitting down, is medical cannabis isn't illegal. And if you follow the statutes in this state, no cannabis is illegal because it's a controlled drug, and the commissioner has never published the New Hampshire Controlled Drug Schedule. At some point, I won't, I won't go on and on in this meeting here, but I do have proof, and I would like to speak to anybody after this meeting about that. Um, the, the guts of it are, I have instituted a 91A request for a published New Hampshire controlled drug schedule. There is a law in this state that says it needs to be published in a newspaper. It's RSA 21, section 32. I have all that information. It hasn't happened. So, that's kind of a side issue, but I think it's very important. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Constantine. We'll take any written testimony that you have. Thank you, sir. Okay, and our final witness will be Clayton Holden.
protection towards medical marijuana patients like myself, the Attorney General released a press statement six months after he took office and it was on the news and I'm sorry that no one failed to mention it at all. Um, it's something you can see online if you just Google it. Um, on my lap I hold just two years of emergency room visits that I myself had to go through and this is when I was only 20 years old. Since then my disease has gotten so much worse that if you were to see the records for the past two years, it would be about three times the size. I, at one point, I had an EMT on both sides of me. They tried 11 times in both of my arms to get an IV in, and then three times in both sides of my neck because they thought it was the end of my time. During that time, there was also four law enforcement officers because I had to dial 911 to get the, the ambulance there. And the look of shock on everyone's face to see them watch me and the pain that I was suffering in made me feel worse than they felt. No one should have to see someone suffer like that. And if anyone can't see the pain and suffering that people go through and show compassion for people less fortunate than themselves, then they have no business in politics, law enforcement, or any of those branches. Politics are supposed to uphold the law and do what's right for the people that they speak on behalf of. And it saddens me that we got so close four years ago and they, that we didn't get it passed. Um, I was a medical marijuana patient up until about six months ago when I was given marijuana that was laced. Uh, I am not sure what it was, but it sent me to the emergency room after blacking out and then again a month later the same thing happened. An officer talked to me at the hospital and said that he would very much not like to show up at the house and see that happen again. Otherwise there would be legal actions he would have to take. With that said, this law would pass, if passed, would protect me from that ever happening to myself or anyone for that matter. The last thing that I need to say is I have been on every drug known to man for my pain from Vicodin, Oxycontin, Methadone, and right now my pain clinic is considering putting a morphine pump inside my body. I don't deserve it, but if I am to use marijuana ever again, and they are now starting regular drug testing, and they find that they will not be able to treat my pain, my twisted spine, my pinched nerve, or any of the other issues that I have, I have grown my own gardens of marijuana in California, and like many people have said, the laws over there are, they're very messed up. But I can say this, the 10 months that I was there, I went from taking 16 pills a day, which includes seven Oxycontins a day, down to none. And I came back from California weighing 82 pounds, the most I've ever weighed in all my life. And since I stopped using marijuana, I am now down to 75 pounds. And I'm sorry, just one more thing. This was the hand that I was dealt, and it could have been dealt to anyone in this room. 
anyone sitting here could be easily be in my place. And I became an activist for other people, not myself. I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have. I especially want to thank uh, Nicole and Clayton for making the arduous journey here today in the state of the sidewalks. Uh, this will conclude the hearing. There will be a full committee work session on this bill next Wednesday at 9 a.m. in room 205. Thank you all for your attendance today.